Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening. I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to our program, Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight, we discover what ocean sediments reveal about the uh, history of Earth's climate, among other things. Our distinguished guest is Richard Murray, Professor of Earth and Environment at Boston University. Dr. Murray received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in 1991, and he joined the Earth and Environment faculty at Boston University in 1992, and has been instrumental in the progress of marine biogeochemical research ever since. Dr. Murray's research focuses on the analysis of marine sediments for indications of change over long periods of time changes in ocean and marine life chemistry, changes in Earth's climate, changes in tectonic process. All that wealth of information is recorded in marine sediments. He'll tell us about how these sediments are gathered and how scientists analyze the sediments. And since he's contributed significantly to these methods, he's an excellent resource for state-of-the-art analysis. Dr. Murray's expertise is especially appreciated this time beca because ocean sediment data has been a key resource in climate change research. But he's gone further. Rick Murray is also a committed citizen, serving as selectman in his seaside community of Situate, Massachusetts. He's been a major spokesman for communities like his that are forced to make serious preparations for climate change. We're very fortunate to hear from Dr. Murray tonight on both uh, the ocean sediments and the information they provide and on the impact of climate change on vulnerable communities. It's a great honor to welcome Richard Murray. Welcome, Dr. Murray. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, and we'll start right in. This is a very long word, your field. What do you call that, this convergence field? Well, I guess the phrase of biogeochemistry is a is is laden with prefixes. There's, <laughs> there's the bio, there's the geo, there's the, the chemistry, um, but what's not said is the physics, but what's great about oceanography in general and overall is the integration of all the core fields of science. So. Right. And that's what that phrase means. It's no longer possible just to we really want to understand how the Earth's system works and something as complicated as climate or something as complicated as virtually anything now of geology or oceanography. Yeah. We really need to bring together the chemistry, the physics, the biology, the geology all together. So it's really a big change in science these days in that field. Can What can sediments tell us? Why do you look at sediments? Can you give us an idea, ocean sediments? Sediments, in short, are sort of pages of a book. Mm -hmm. And they, they record, uh, not always perfectly, uh, but they record overall the history of our planet. And as the sediment is deposited relatively quickly or relatively slowly in the ocean basins, uh, we're able to take marine cores. We go out on ships. We lower basically hollow pipes down to the seafloor, plunge the pipe into the sediment, and pull up the core. And we're able to look at the, either the different geological compositions or the chemical compositions or the biological compositions. And they record Earth's natural system if we go back relatively deep in time. Mm -hmm. But also if sedimentation is fast enough, we're also able to look at changes only over the last 50 years or 100 years or so. Um, I remember that we were talking a little while ago and you mentioned that this varies a around the world. You go all over the world uh, mm -hmm. getting ocean sediments, but you said it depends on whether they were uh, developed fast or slow and so on. What makes that difference? Sediment can accumulate and be deposited very fast. Mm -hmm. And if it's depositing fast, any layering that we do gives a very highly resolved record. 
it's a very fine-tuned record mm. of short periods of time because the sediment's piling up fast. That's perfect for what we want to do in some situations if we want to see how climate has changed or erosion has changed or some other process has changed over very fast, short periods of time. Other times, though, we want to look deeper into millions of years of mm. records. And there, we intentionally go to sediment that's been deposited very slowly. Mm. So our coring devices can penetrate deeply, but get a lot of time recorded. And the sedimentation rate, the, the burial rate, will vary depending on how much biological productivity there is in the mm. water, so how fast dying plankton settle on the mm -hmm. seafloor, how close we are to the, to the continents, so how fast erosion mm -hmm. is happening, mm -hmm. or other processes such as the wind-blown transport of, of dust from, say, the Sahara Desert or from the Tibetan Plateau out into the ocean. So there's a, a geological, a biological, and a chemical and physical reasons yeah. that contribute to why sediment might be fast or why sediment might be slow, and we need both to, to understand completely and develop a full record of, of change, uh, climate change, uh, at different parts of our, of our planet. So this variation is actually it's very important. You want a, like an array of these sediments from different regions, but also in terms of the, sp the, the uh, speed by which they were deposited, I guess, and so Absolutely. on. You get, you really do have the pages of a book in, in that case. Absolutely. It's much more comprehensive. That's right. Just like there's yeah. no one book, yeah. you know, in the, in the reference section. Of a book of a library that can give you all the answers to everything. Yeah. Maybe some would say that's Wikipedia, but, um, <laughs> but no, it, it's yeah, not. Right. Uh, we we need cores from all over the world. Okay. Um, for example, one of the really interesting questions going on in climate studies these days is the role of Antarctica, mm -hmm. southernmost continent, deeply buried in ice and the role of Greenland and the northern hemisphere, right. which has been very well studied. And the relationship between uh, glacial and non-glacial states of climate in Earth history in the northern hemisphere compared to the southern hemisphere, there's no one location you can go to get that. So colleagues of mine or myself, we take a lot of sedimentary records near Antarctica. We take a lot of sedimentary records in the North Atlantic or the North Pacific to try to study this hemispheric contrast. Mm -hmm. So we need to go all over and get different burial rates, different biological records, different land-derived records all out in the open ocean to um, sort of weave that tapestry of our of Earth's it's, history. It's, it's say it is like you weave it together Absolutely. in the end uh, that it doesn't, it's uh, one area is not representative of the whole planet by that's any correct. means. So that's, it's much richer than that. Um, what are the most interesting things in a sediment? Does that vary or like, what do you look for? What is particularly significant? Well, I think if you asked 100 marine geologists well, what, they, <laughs> what they found was the most interesting part yeah. of mud, um, <laughs> we'd probably come up with 200 different answers. Yeah. Uh, but um, just like the field title sort of says, uh, there's biology involved. Um, some of my work with colleagues in particular from the University of Rhode Island um, is working on the subsea floor biosphere. So that's the biosphere, the microbial ecosystems buried beneath the seafloor. And there we have microbes that have been very slowly as a community turning over because the amount of food down there, basically organic matter that they degrade, is very, very small way out in the open ocean. So there's a host of people who are studying the biosphere, but to understand the biosphere we also need to understand the minerals, mm -hmm. particularly the iron-bearing minerals or the other minerals that are um, part of the sediment because the microbes are living in intimate association with those minerals. So there's the biology and the geology and there's chemistry involved as well. So that's one sort of area of my personal research and that a lot of people work on. Climate records, mm -hmm. some people and my colleagues and, my, and myself we look at the chemical records of dust that's blowing mm -hmm, off of Asia mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the Tibetan Plateau because just like we have a, a, a jet stream here in North America that we talk about and we read and we hear about it with the weather and the westerly winds, the westerly winds from Asia pick up 
dust and land derived material from the Tibetan plateau and they blow that out and it lands in the Pacific Ocean and then I can go out and take marine cores of that and that gives us an indication in the past of how wet or dry Asia may have been which uh -huh. tells us about climate right and broadly speaking drier conditions contribute more dust to the ocean or wetter conditions will lead to a different mineral composition uh -huh. making it out to the ocean so we can look at all sorts of different what we call proxies because we can't there's no direct record of climate five million years ago right. we need to make inferences but our inferences are very well constrained by our studies of the modern in the last 20 or 30 years in particular we have such a better understanding of how our modern system works so if one parameter is changing if wind speed is changing mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. there's a different record uh, a different type of dust that's produced in the modern and so we can then study that and apply what we know about the modern and apply it to the past which is why we're really able to come up with some quite sophisticated understanding of climate in the past and and other processes just before you go on, like with the, the climate there, you mentioned this, that you can determine where the dust came from. Yes. And I'm not sure that we, we all understand that uh, some of the dust from deserts like the Sahara goes clear across the world and, and so on. And you're talking about that when we, it lands in the ocean. You can identify its origins? Yes, we can. Um, sometimes in some locations we can do a better or a more precise mm -hmm. job than in others um, but I've done a lot of work in a small basin just north of Venezuela and there it's called the Cariacao Basin and it's a small body of water right next to Venezuela and there it has very fast sedimentation like we were just talking mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. centimeters mm -hmm. per thousand years so it's very very fast for that's fast for us. Mm -hmm. And so there we're able to look at dust from the Sahara Desert that has blown clear across the Atlantic and ends up getting deposited in this little basin off of Venezuela on its way out to the Gulf of Mexico or all the way in. We can track Saharan dust all the way up the eastern seaboard all the way up to here. But in the Cariacao Basin off of Venezuela that I'm speaking about, mm -hmm. there we get really nice records of how wet or dry or the relative wind speed um, the northern part of Africa and therefore the, the northern hemisphere um, of planet Earth has been over very recent past thousand years, mm -hmm. 500 years, thousand years, 10,000 years and when one considers that the last glacial maximum the last time glaciers here in Boston were you know, about a mile <laughs> thick or so, that was only 20,000 years ago. Mm. And so we can go to places like Cariacao and learn a lot about how our planet was set up and how our planet was operating uh, 20,000 years ago. So you, I can't remember when the, like the Sahara and, and, and I guess a number of these deserts at one time were uh, uh, very rich with uh, flora and fauna mm -hmm. and then gradually dried out. You can trace that back through the sediments. You can construct the dates and uh, with the conditions. I, I'm absolutely, not as best as possible. Right, right. Yeah, sure. right. And of course, the but further back in time, it. the mm -hmm. harder it is. Of course. But right. uh, we're, we're getting, with, with new technical developments and new computational abilities, the ability to date mm -hmm. the sediment is getting better and better every year. Uh, just exactly on that. So here we have a, a, a core, uh, right? And you have these layers in it. And the layers are comprised of different kinds of material. So you analyze those, but now you have to date it. And you've got cores from all over the world. How do you date it? Can you tell us? Different cores usually get dated by different techniques. Okay. And if a core is of a certain young age, there's a lot more techniques we can use I see. compared to cores that might be older. If it's relatively young, we can do carbon-14 dating, I which see. is very, yes. people are most familiar with very that. Very accurate. But that's only persistent. good to 10, 20, 30,000 years, plus or minus or so. Um, and with material that has abundant organic matter. Yeah. As we go further back in time, 500,000 years, a million years, 10 million years, we often will use variations in Earth's magnetic 
field, for example, because some of those very fine grain minerals that are deposited in the ocean mud will record Earth's magnetic field that was in existence at the time of deposition. And by comparing that to independently documented variations in the North Pole pointing north versus the yeah. North Pole pointing south right. and the intensity of the magnetic field, that gives us one orientation, one set of conditions. We also will use radiometric dating, mm. where the decay of uranium to its daughter products, which occurs at a known rate, um, we can use those um, techniques to provide a completely different set of age controls. We also look at the evolution of different microfossils, plankton, mm. that are found deposited in the sediment. And we know when certain fossils evolved and then when they died out. And there are people that study a dizzying array of micro of microfossils. So uh, for example, on a recent cruise that I was just fortunate enough to be on, we were looking at the Sea of Japan and the East Sea, the body of water between Japan and mm -hmm. Korea. Mm -hmm. Okay, right there. And um, on board, we had paleomagnetic people looking at the magnetic intensity. We had um, biostratigraphers looking at the microfossils. And we have samples taken so we can do the radiometric dating. So cobbling together all these different yet independent techniques to date the cores, we come up with a very, uh, very strong, what we call age model a very strong understanding of the changes and the dates of different horizons in the sediment. Now, it sounds like that you're able to kind of reinforce your uh, interpretation by having these very different uh, experts or the, the different uh, things that you're looking at here, uh, indicators. So it sounds as though you could put together a rather accurate um, map at, at the, after that. Is that there true is. today yes. and with all this very Science advanced. is all about testing hypotheses. Right. And so, but we do, you know, if we have a paleomagnetic age understanding going down mm -hmm, through mm -hmm, the layers, mm -hmm. usually just because the technique is relatively rapid, we, we get a good understanding and then we add in the biostratigraphy right. and, and there's, well, gee, this is inconsistent. How do we resolve this? Because there's only one age at a particular yeah, horizon. Right. And then you, you realize, well, maybe some of the sediment has been remobilized and reworked or, or things. But, but a lot of what we do, and I, don't, I am not an age dater mm -hmm, myself, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but a lot of what my colleagues do and what we oversee is the integration of all these different techniques to, to get at that. Okay. Um, I, before we leave that, I just want to kind of uh, reinforce one thing. Uh, you mentioned the magnetic uh, uh, pole shifting, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I'm not sure that people uh, uh, understand that the poles have shifted or do shift, and I don't know if it's a real regular thing, you know, every X years or whatever. Could you just give us a little information about that? So that because that's such a good clue, I sure. imagine. Well, the, the Earth's magnetic field, which with a handheld compass, the compass mm -hmm. points north or mm -hmm. points south, depending on you know, where you are, um, basically acts as a bar magnet. Mm -hmm. And you can visualize a bar magnet just plunging right through the Earth and coming out in the southern hemisphere. And that magnetic north pole is located differently from the geographic mm -hmm. rotational mm -hmm. axis mm -hmm. of, the, of the north pole. But it's relatively close, and over long time periods, it's thought that it's essentially an approximation of the rotational axis. And it so happens for reasons that, that scientists still don't fully understand, but the Earth's magnetic field does change its orientation. The Earth does not itself flip. doesn't flip, <laughs> but Thank what goodness. is now magnetically north becomes mm -hmm. magnetically south mm -hmm. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. It's thought to be due to the fact that the outer core of the Earth is um, is liquid iron, and the inner core is solid iron and nickel, and that it. I think I have that correct, and uh, so that's where the magnetic field is orienting, and because it's moving and mobile, it's thought to. And again, this is way out of my field, but this mm -hmm. is what is um, discussed. So these fields, uh, it can switch, and 
it switches you know hundreds of thousands of years time yeah. scale yeah. it's not exactly repeated mm -hmm. there's no exact okay every 400,000 years bang on one Tuesday afternoon it's gonna flip um, but there have been repeated time periods of switching throughout Earth history that have been painstakingly documented and painstakingly researched and tested and we can use these to globally correlate because mm -hmm. it's one Earth, it's one magnetic field. Uh, that enables us to compare a core taken in this location uh, to another core taken at that different location. I see, okay. Let's switch off to what you specialize in. Um, you mentioned a little bit ago that uh, there, you're involved with people from all over the world. There are teams from a lot of different countries. You're spread out in different areas and you're all gathering these cores and stuff. And you do yourself some very interesting work. Could you please tell us about it? Many of the research expeditions or research cruises with which I'm involved certainly are international. Mm -hmm. One of the programs that I do a lot of work, the U.S. supports uh, roughly a third or half of the cost. That's through the National Science Foundation, which is supported by taxpayer dollars, and it's basic research into how the Earth and how the oceans work, mm -hmm. in essence. Um, this program is the, um, is the largest marine geology program uh, in, in the world and there's about 20 to 25 different countries involved. Uh, so uh, various consortia with Japan, the U.S., Korea, basically every country in Europe and Australia, New Zealand, and others. So participating in these is wonderful experience because we get to work with leading scientists from all sorts of different nations. Um, and we take cores and we go out and we look at the layers and we look at, at climate records. Uh, my most recent um, cruise. Um, we went from Alaska to Busan, South Korea, and our main area was to, our main goal was to look at changes in the Asian climate. And that changes in Asian climate can be documented by the dust patterns coming off of Tibet, the Tibetan Plateau, mm -hmm. and also China, uh, northern China, depositing wind blown dust into the Sea of Japan. And one of the things we're looking at is the development of the East Asian monsoon mm, system. Yes, now, you've done a lot when on we it. Say, when we say monsoon, everybody thinks torrential rainfall, mm -hmm. which is entirely accurate. But that rainfall is delivering water to the food supply, mm -hmm. agriculture. And the East Asian monsoon uh, delivers the water supply to about 20% of the Earth's population. Mm -hmm. And if you tie the East Asian monsoon into the Indian monsoon and the Indonesian and sort of Vietnam, Thailand mm -hmm. area, that's approximately half of the world's population. So understanding the water supply, which is climate, mm -hmm. understanding in the past, and not hugely long ago in the past, but 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, what parts of that system were drier than they are now? Mm -hmm. And was winter time back then colder or drier than winter is now? And was summer drier or colder or wetter than it is now. We call that seasonality. Mm -hmm. What's the contrast between winter and summer? As we know here, it's quite a large contrast <laughs> between winter and summer. And that has profound impact uh, over decadal or longer time frames on the amount of water that's delivered uh, to different areas. So this cruise in the Sea of Japan region, uh, Sea of Japan East Sea region, um, was looking at the sort of the position of the jet stream mm -hmm. as it comes across Tibet and China. Mm -hmm. And is the average position down south or is the average position a little more up north? To draw a North American analogy, although it's a very different system, but it's sort of like are most of the storms going to be coming, the jet stream coming through sort of the mid-Atlantic mm -hmm. or coming in down from Canada. Mm -hmm. We all know here mm -hmm. that there's a big difference mm -hmm. when that weather is coming mm -hmm. across, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the south of the U.S. Mm -hmm. or if it's coming across, you know, the Great Lakes or up through, up through Canada. And over long periods of time, because there's a big difference between weather mm -hmm. and climate, yes. short term, long term. But you can imagine how if the average position of the jet stream is more northerly or more southerly, you're going to get a very big difference in seasonality and that's going to dramatically change the delivery of water to a particular area. So in the East Asian monsoon studies that we're doing, 
We're trying to get a better understanding of what the future may hold. As our planet is globally warming, mm -hmm. I hesitate to use the word predict because mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. very, very hard to do. Mm -hmm. But to develop a better understanding of the boundary conditions of how dry could it possibly get, which areas may get wetter, mm -hmm. which areas may get drier, generally what what sort of world are we most likely to be living in and not thousands of years from now yeah. but 50 years from now 100 years from now and again 20 percent of the world depends on that water supply and with the Indian and the Indonesian that's half of the world so understanding this monsoon climate is of huge relevance to, to humanity and it our understanding of it comes from just looking at these, these mud That's layers. That's the, I was, uh, that is the most amazing thing. I mean, can, is there anything, uh, they, they look at different things to analyze climate as, as, the, mm -hmm. as the whole issue of climate change has developed. So there are a lot of different things to look at, a lot of different indicators. But this sounds particularly rich. Uh, are you a little biased if you say that <laughs> that's particularly well, rich? It, it, it just it, seems like a very accurate source. Yeah, sure, it takes, it takes all types. As we mm -hmm. said earlier, mm -hmm. when we're talking mm -hmm. about different cores and different yeah, sedimentations. Right. I, I mean, understand. there's a whole other uh, repository, a whole other set of books, which are the ice cores. Yes, right. But cores, cores from Greenland, again, that go, Greenland that or date. Antarctica, yeah. and those are layers, right. and they trap atmospheric gas, and that's where we have our exquisite understanding of carbon dioxide and yes. temperature change, where there's very clearly the link between carbon dioxide and climate over those time cycles. And I'm jealous of those ice core people so, uh, in some ways yeah. because they get that record. Right. But they're jealous of us For marine peoples because we get different records exactly. as well and we I go see. back longer in time. And it takes, again, the cobbling together, the different threads of the tapestry, right. I return to that, the different threads of the tapestry so we can work together the atmosphere, the ocean, the land, uh, put it all together. Right, and it's another reason, I guess, for having uh, this convergence of fields that you need many types of deep understanding in order to put it together, and you're still uh, learning a lot. Since you know and have worked so much on this record of climate change and the causes for it, can you give us your analysis of that now in terms of climate change? I still hear, even around here, and Massachusetts is pretty sophisticated in this, but you still hear people saying it's not true. <laughs> but what's your take? Well, roughly speaking, more scientists are in consensus agreement that climate change is real and is happening and is due to human behavior. Mm -hmm. More scientists are in agreement about that than doctors are about the linkage between smoking and lung cancer. Oh my goodness, yeah. So I think you'd be pretty hard pressed to walk down the street and find someone who says there's absolutely no relationship right. between I smoking. Right, I don't see it in the science community, Correct. right? The problem right. is not there. Right. Now, on the other hand, we all have, or many of us might have, an Aunt Matilda or an Uncle yeah. Harry who's been smoking like a chimney and is <laughs> 117 years old and doing just great. But those are it's statistical anomalies. Yeah. That doesn't mean, and I, I don't mean to <laughs> don't encourage too close to home or anything <laughs> like that either. Um, but do we understand cancer? Mm -hmm. No. Right. No. But we understand mm -hmm. some key things. Right. And that's the situation we're in now. We understand some key things about climate. We understand the carbon dioxide linkage. We understand so much. People like to focus on what we don't understand, and scientists don't like to study what we already know, right? The whole point yeah, is to right, study right, what we don't right, know. Right. So we have to do, we scientists have to do a better job, in my opinion, pointing out what we do know. Yes. And um, not focusing so much on the uncertainty, but focusing on and communicating what we know and how we can do better um, reestablishing what we know. But it really is, um, um, again, like cancer, we don't understand everything about climate change, but we understand quite a lot. It's 
a remarkable consensus. I was going to say it seems as though this is one area of science where there may be fewer disputes than in many other areas where there are real uh, differences of opinion, theoretical differences and stuff, but it sounds as though from numerous fields, but certainly from yours, that you have really strong evidence and you can say this is... In, in some ways, in some ways, absolutely yes, mm -hmm. but I actually think all fields of science roughly have the same amount of agreement or disagreement uh, okay. about major theories. I mean, we there are a lot of people still studying evolution, but yeah. we know evolution's going on, right? right I mean, right. all this sort of thing. Right. So there's, there's um, I don't think our field is any different. What is different is it's been highly politicized. Yes, and I see. I think one of my frustrations as a scientist particularly has been over the last couple of years where, um, frankly, I think unethical accusations mm -hmm. are being made at scientists by people who may or may not be well-meaning mm -hmm. uh, about them leveling these accusations at scientists. Uh, some of us feel somewhat persecuted uh, in this way, and that's a strong word, but I'm using it kind that's, of You've got a lot of, of company directly. who feel yeah. that way, yes. Um, and what troubles me is there's a lack of understanding about what science is and how science works. We, we're not, you know, robots and we're not um, pie in the sky in our quest for the great unknown. We're, we're humans. Um, science is about being objective and about testing hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's all about. But the other thing is, is people don't understand the, particularly the American scientific yeah. mindset. We Americans love the little guy. Mm -hmm. We love the person who is going to take down the whole field. <laughs> that would be fantastic for my career. <laughs> if I had proof that climate change either wasn't happening or it was happening but it was had nothing to do with humanity, all the incentives are for me to publish that. I would be one of the most famous scientists. My papers would get cited. I'd be giving lectures all over the world and all this. All the incentives to me, for me personally as a scientist, are to um, not go along with consensus. Mm -hmm. So it's really, and people don't seem to understand that. And then there's always the, some somebody always invariably brings up, well, this is just invented by scientists so they can get more yes, grants. This is, um, uh, if you look at the size of the grants and you look at how we're sort of doing <laughs> compared to some of the other large financial mm -hmm. entities mm -hmm. who have significant incentives to to cast stones, mm -hmm. uh, it's that's not what it's about. But most importantly, we're all people. I would be, um, as I said, extremely um, professionally successful if I were to uncover anything and all the incentives are for me to do that but I'm sorry the data do not support that right virtually all the data go on to show things and what's also interesting is that when we don't understand something like for example over the last couple of years it's been thought that the earth's temperature hasn't been increasing yes. as much and so yes. well and that gets popularized by if you're yeah. looking at just a particular time frame you can say that but if you look over a longer long, record of right. 50 years or so, you can see from your perspective, time going this way, there's ups, there's this, there's that, and uh, yeah. you know, overall it's there. Right, so very much that's so. That's my, my biggest frustration, but I will yeah. also say I have great faith, because at cocktail parties or as an elected official in my town, right. speaking right. it with people in the supermarket and so on, more and more people are getting it, and I do think it is one of those situations where, again, back to the smoking and back to the cancer, where Washington, D.C. is out of touch with Americans. Right. Well, I absolutely believe yeah. that. Washington, D.C. is out of touch on the science of climate change. Right. And lobbyists are doing a very good job of keeping them out of touch, it yes. sounds like. That's right. But that is a peculiar nation also, uh, I, I guess you have experienced it is that as a, as a scientist that we have a tremendous scientific community. We do. Brilliant universities do. and everything. And yet we have, I believe, the highest percentage 
of population that still rejects evolution. We haven't made it quite yet to climate change. Um, and then the other part is that people do believe in things that are fundamentally debunked, discredited, and everything else. So the vaccination uh, problem yes. for, is a very good example of that. And people are routinely fooled by yes. nonsense. So and I realize that. that science community has a long way to go, but it must be very frustrating. I hope that the voters will get busy here and uh, uh, make the government do what it needs to do, for sure. I think but, so, but again, I do have faith with the people. Yeah. And I think it comes down to education. Yeah. And on the one hand, it's, it's, it's um, uh, an interesting dilemma, as, mm -hmm. as you put it, I think. Um, but on the other hand, what people have access to in terms of information with smartphones and the internet and web and all this sort of thing. I absolutely have faith that uh, overall data and knowledge are going to trump uh, the other uh, incentives that are out there. Well, they it have, might take longer it, yes, in various right, things, but right, you know, right. throughout time, uh, we humans and we Americans have a very good record um, on figuring things out. It might take a little longer, it might be messier okay. due to our form of government, right, but right. Um, I think the end result will be fine. I just hope it's relatively soon. Yes, in I this, uh, in the hope so too, field, right. In the particular field. Of I government. hope so too. Um, before we go on to your role as a, as a selectman in mm -hmm. your community and the, the problems of your uh, seaside community, mm -hmm. um, is there anything in the work that you have done or that really concentrated on that has been particularly exciting for you, a discovery that you were especially pleased by? I've been blessed to have a wonderful job that I get paid to study mud and, <laughs> to, go out and to go out to sea yeah. and do so. There's no one particular thing to be candid that I feel particularly um, proud of or was particularly exciting more than the rest because they're all way up yeah, there. Yeah. I will say I've seen some amazing things with this. One of the research trips I went on, again, with colleagues from the University of Rhode Island uh, who were the leaders of it, and I was just one of the team. Um, we went to the center of the South Pacific Ocean. And this is the largest biological desert in the world. It happens mm. to be an ocean, mm -hmm. but it has the lowest biological productivity on the planet. And the water there, because there's no plankton floating, essentially no plankton floating in the water, is exceptionally clear. And when I mean clear, imagine if you're on a ferry boat here or in Boston mm -hmm. Harbor mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. and you can see maybe 10 or 20 feet down on a good day. There, we're able to look, I'm doing the conversion in my head, approximately 250 feet straight down in the water. And uh, because it is so far from land, there's no nutrients, there's no dust delivering nutrients to that part of the world. It has exceptionally slow sedimentation rates, so we're able to look very far back in geological time. Okay. We're working on subsea floor biosphere. There's such low organic matter as a food source to those microbes. We've documented that these are probably the slowest turnover um, biological population on the planet. And it is just mud. And so you're looking at it and it's just mud. But it's kind of cool when you look yeah. at it and you realize, wow, that's what's going on in here. Or other parts of the globe I've been to where we've looked at material that's roughly the age of the, when the dinosaurs were wiped mm -hmm, out by, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. by the impact 65 and a half million years ago. I've actually held that mud in my hand. Ah. And we're in the we're in the Caribbean Sea, so there that's a completely different situation. Yeah. Um, you know, we were down a long distance. We were down 800, 900 meters, so uh, you know, 3,000 feet below the sea floor, and you're holding this mud, and you know, there's no dinosaur femur or anything like that because <laughs> it's just mud. But you're holding it, and it's like, okay, this is when the dinosaurs were, and then there's this sharp line and there's a color change, and then above it, that's no dinosaurs, and you're, it's kind of cool when you can I just bet. hold that in your hand, right. and it just came up from the seafloor, and you're holding it, and it's like, wow, that's, that is a fundamental 
you know, boundary in Earth history. Yes. And so those sorts of thrills right. um, are, are um, why what I do is just cool. I just think so. <laughs> it's just cool. So you're just yeah. overjoyed to go to work most yeah, of the time. I really, that I think it's I, always it's learning, really always, always, yeah. uh, always learning. Um, you, uh, uh, you are also uh, an active citizen, and, and I think that's relatively rare. You know, many scientists go out and speak to the public and stuff, but you're actually elected mm -hmm. uh, to do something. Tell us about your community and about being a selectman, and uh, for sure tell us about the particular community and its situation. Well, I live in Situate. Yeah, situation, situation. <laughs> I live in Situate, which, as many people are aware, is a coastal community mm -hmm. south of Boston. And you're probably most familiar with us whenever there's a northeaster that comes in. It and, hits and the you TV every time. channels hit us, <laughs> and they all come down. And we say it rains cats and dogs and anchor men and women <laughs> uh, in, our, in our little town. Uh, but the reason why you see Situate on TV so much is because its shoreline faces directly northeast and our latitude is north of the tip of Cape Cod. Mm. So we are on the North Atlantic and we are facing it completely perpendicular. The North Shore, Gloucester, Salem, those yeah. areas, they get hit as well, but there the shoreline is parallel. I so see. They don't get it nearly right. as directly as we right. do, although I, I, I don't mean to minimize their impacts as well. Right, All right. right. So uh, I am a selectman and uh, this is a small town I think it's 20, about 000. the size of this one, yes. It's 20,000 yeah. uh, winter, 30,000 in the summer, about 13,000 elected, uh, 13,000 voters, registered voters. Um, and uh, selectmen are the executive branch in Massachusetts and a lot of New England and other places. So the executive branch, so I'm, there's five of us. I'm one-fifth of the president, mm -hmm. in other words. Mm -hmm. um, the legislative branch, there's no Congress, but instead the legislative branch is town meeting. So that's Norman Rockwell, people yes, standing up at right, town meeting. Right. And the judicial branch is taken up by the county and state and sometimes the federal courts. And so we have our three modes of government and I'm involved in one of them. And as a scientist, I did get involved because our community, like many, is facing very real decisions about our water supply and we're facing very real decisions about climate change. Mm -hmm. We have many seawalls and um, our coastal community gets flooded. We've had some fatalities through the decades and we've had a lot of homes that get flooded out. Um, so although I am not a coastal geologist, I, do, I don't study mm -hmm, as my research mm -hmm, as we mm -hmm, talked about mm -hmm. movement of sand or anything like that. I do have more than passing knowledge about climate change and what the future may or may not hold in terms of sea level rise and storm intensity and storm frequency. And so I work very hard with uh, my fellow citizens in Situate to address these um, concerns. If we just look at seawalls, for one example, to fix all of our seawalls is a $55 million problem. Our entire budget is a little more than that, mm -hmm. but we, we can't do that on mm -hmm. our own. Mm -hmm. um, through this position, I've been fortunate recently to be appointed to um, Governor Patrick's Council on Coastal Erosion, where we're looking at all of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Massachusetts shorelines and what we're going to do about it. Right. Um, do you find the public receptive to making necessary changes? For example, that you know you're going to have to change your uh, where, how close you live to the to the sea and, and so forth. Yes and no. Mm. And it's not just proportional to where you live. Mm -hmm. um, situate, much of it's on the coastline, but by no means all of it. Mm -hmm. majority mm -hmm. of people do not live on the coastline. I see. But we're all involved in, I mean, there's a commercial fishing fleet. The harbor is one of our, perhaps our central location. It's definitely a coastal community. And when you get hit with the northeaster, you, you all That's get right. hit, right? That's yeah. right. Yeah. So I, I do find people um, receptive mm -hmm. because they see the data, and their data uh, their instruments that they see the data with are their own two eyes. Mm -hmm. And there's, people can recall the blizzard of 78 where Peggotty Beach, which is one of our main areas, um, was decimated and many, many homes were lost. And over the last five years with Nemo and all these other storms, Irene and, you know, take your pick, they've seen with their own two eyes mm -hmm. and they've lived it. Mm -hmm. They've been flooded out or they know friends who are flooded out or a school gets canceled 
um, because the high school is used as a shelter and there yeah. are 500 people in that shelter. Um, so it's, uh, people are receptive. I've been a selectman for about eight years now and involved in town government in other ways before that, so roughly 10, 15 years or so. And I've been able to see how people's mindsets are changing. Mm -hmm. And this is why I'm somewhat optimistic about the future, because I do sense that people, um, the discussion is no longer, is this happening? The discussion is evolving towards what are we going to do exactly. about it, and that's mm -hmm. very reassuring. And people might have differences of opinion about what we want to do about it, but people are now really saying, all right, this is definitely happening here, um, and let's talk about these, these different What are our things. options yeah. and that's given what, that, yeah. And those right. are some of the things I'm talking about. You know, people talk a lot about seawalls, and seawalls, as I've said many times, have been, are, and will be an important part of foreshore mm -hmm. protection. Mm -hmm. But they're not the only thing. And in fact, seawalls are eroding our beaches mm -hmm. because the energy can't get uh. dissipated and absorbed. They're, they're blocking the supply of sand and so on, but they do protect Good, yeah. homes immediately. Right, right. So there's pluses and right, minuses, right. but there's long-term issues that we uh, need to address as well, some of which I've, I've written about yeah, and, yeah. and so on. Right. Uh, I should point out, we will tie this up now, but uh, for the audience that uh, he's been very active, Dr. Murray has been actively, has written in the Boston Globe and so forth and has communicated especially about uh, the climate change in this area and the effects of these storms and so on and on the event page for him on our website uh, there are a list of articles yeah. you can access. So. Uh, I will have to stop there and let you let talk to the audience a bit. But Dr. Sure. Murray, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thank thank you. you. Thank you. It was a good discussion. The rate of sedimentation, you said um, when it happens quickly, you're talking about centimeters per thousand years. Is that what you said? Yes. It doesn't seem like much. Well, uh, that, that's true. Um, centimeters per thousand years might not seem like much because according to you know, how you and I live our lives, that, that's not that much. Um, but when we see 20 or 30 centimeters, you know, something like this per thousand years, and if it's layered under a microscope, you can see layers. In some cases, you can see winter and you can see summer. So in a period of time that's recorded in this much sediment, for example, under a microscope, you can see winter and you can see summer and you can almost count each annual year in some locations. Now that's rarity, that's a rarity, but um, it's not just one location that we can do that. Um, so you're talking a lot about like, what biochemistry is, um, uh, I misspoke, but you were talking about what your field is doing a lot today about like how it's focused on climate change. Will you see this field expanding to different areas of research? I think a lot of what we're going to be looking at in the coming decade or so is certainly going to be related to climate change, but one can't study climate change without also studying tectonics, how mountains are built, um, how volcanoes erupt. Uh, a huge area of my research involves looking at the record of volcanism. So when volcanoes erupt in the past, leaves ash deposits out in the ocean, and there's a potential link between volcanism and climate. So I have a whole set of colleagues who are, are true blue volcanologists that study only how volcanoes erupt. So I collaborate with those people and there's linkages between tectonics and volcanism and climate. So I think that asking interesting questions and making interesting analyses of the marine sediment that's out there is just going to lead to a whole dizzying array of questions that we can ask about virtually any aspect of, of Earth's history. And, and people have been doing this for a long time. It's only relatively recently we've really been able to put more descriptive names on what we do. 
And it's been very helpful because the next generation of scientists coming up, they don't even think that this is anything unusual at all. Of course you have to study the biology along with the chemistry, along with the geology. How else would you do it? But for quasi old timers like myself, um, it, we weren't trained that way. It was really unusual for someone to have expertise in you know, two, let alone three fields, but now it's, it's the norm. So I think there's going to be a wide range of studies that people are going to be doing. Uh, so seeding the uh, oceans with iron regarding climate change is, is not necessarily related to a warmer ocean or a colder ocean. Um, it has been scientifically documented that uh, iron as a, as a um, nutrient um, is important. And if we do add it to some areas of the ocean, it will increase the amount of biological productivity because you're just fertilizing the oceans. And that may or may not remove atmospheric carbon dioxide from the or carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and put it in the oceans. So it's not so much a warm ocean or a colder ocean necessarily per se, it's which part of the oceans. I'm not advocating that as a, an approach to um, uh, solve global warming or anything, but it's one of those areas that we can learn a lot about how the ocean works by, by doing some very well constrained studies of what happens if you do put iron into the ocean and, and so on. It seems that in the past, and this is something I have worked on, it seems that in the past in some important areas when natural iron is added the amount of biological productivity does increase. However, the next step, the link to climate, is far less understood. The first step there's still a lot of questions, but we're getting a pretty good feeling. You add iron, you're going to increase productivity. But taking that next step is a, quite a big step indeed, which we still need to research. Well, it's all about preparation. We have road signs when we're driving down a road and there's a sharp curve. And uh, we would probably do OK without that road sign, but it certainly helps. And what we're looking for here are road signs. And we're trying to say, you know, we, we at this point, we can't say definitively in the year 2100, which might seem like a long time away from now, but it's actually not. <laughs> We can't say definitively that this part's going to get wetter, this part's going to get drier. But the more constraints we can bring to the system, it helps people prepare. And when I mean people, I mean not only the farmers and so on, but governments. OK, you know, um, maybe we don't want to invest in a 20-year project to build more dams in this part of whatever it might be if, if it's thought that that area is going to get drier. Um, you can look at, for example, the Populate, the populating of Los Angeles. And when they were figuring out how much there was a natural water supply in the early 1900s, purely fortuitously and through no fault of their own because they didn't have the natural records back then, it just so happened that the 10 years that they studied happened to be some of the 10 wettest years on record. So they didn't have the data then. They weren't doing anything knowingly incorrectly, but they didn't have those road signs. And we're trying to build road signs. We're trying to gather the data that there's a curve in the road or there's not a curve in the road, what areas might have it or not. And so the ability to help people plan, help governments plan, is in all likelihood going to help agriculture, help human safety, and so on. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the questions.